Welcome to the Biotech Startups Podcast by Exceda. Join us as we speak with first-time founders, serial entrepreneurs, and experienced investors about the challenges and triumphs of running a biotech startup, from pre-seed to IPO, with your host, John Chi. In our last episode, we spoke with Terry Lowe about his Midwest upbringing, studying psychology and molecular genetics as an undergraduate, pursuing a master's degree in microbiology at Virginia Tech and an MBA in finance at the University of Chicago, and his transition from investment banking to corporate development and marketing roles at Bristol Myers Squibb. If you missed it, be sure to go back and give part one a listen. We continue our conversation in part two, talking about Terry's transition from big pharma to diagnostics, the challenges of moving into the diagnostics industry, and the contrasts between drug and diagnostic development processes. And the next step I made was I went to a, a diagnostic company called SciTech. It's not to be confused. There's another SciTech out, out today. This is a uh, SciTech that was focused on um, uh, liquid-based psychology. And um, again, this was sort of a, a point in my career where, you know, I'd kind of been going through like every few years, it's like I make a, a sort of a slight change or, or a different change. And I was just kind of itching to kind of do a little, something a little bit different because I've been doing like this corporate business development for a while. And even though I did the marketing stint, I was kind of looking to do again, something where I felt more operational, more closer to kind of running a business than it was to, um, you know, be what we call kind of corporate position. So, um, so that was, that was the role I took next. And that was based in the Boston area. And um, that role was, uh, international strategy. So at the time, Sidec was just starting to kind of build out its international presence. And so helping to kind of map that out and figure out what the right in- infrastructure would be needed. So it was it was two kind of challenges, right? When, for me, one was, it was sort of mapping out now an, an international strategy, which was actually the role. But secondly, it was moving into a different type of industry, which was on the diagnostics as opposed to pharma. And that piece actually was surprisingly took me longer probably to pick up than I thought it would. Um, Yeah, because I I had been, you know, kind of coming up through the the pharma side and I was kind of used to how pharma companies work and how you think when you're in a pharma company. I didn't realize that, you know, diagnostics is like a totally different world. (laughs) Yes. Still in the, you know, medical sciences and should all be the same, but it's completely different business and uh, there are different drivers there uh, that that happen in in diagnostics compared to pharma. And just to like double click on that, like what, like for those who who may not know, like the, the the intrinsic differences between pharma and diagnostics. What exactly were just like when you came in, you're like, oh, this is completely different. And I, th- I'm i going to, this will take me a little bit of time of like learning and adjusting yeah. to. Yeah. Well, I think the first problem was I didn't, I didn't even appreciate in the beginning, like how different it was. I just assumed it was like the same. And so I kind of that mindset, like, okay, this is just like a pharma company. And then not realizing until after time has, has passed that I should probably think about things a little differently than I, than I used to. Um, and just maybe a couple couple specific examples. You know, one is that you, if when you look at like the the product margins on you know a pharma drug versus you know a diagnostics on the diagnostic side, like if you if your company can make looking at gross margins like hopefully over sixty percent, and if you're in a pharma company, you know your product margins on a you know on pills for example be like ninety nine percent, right? Yeah. So cheap to make those things, yeah. right? And they sell it so expensive, yeah. right? Um, so what does that what does that mean in practical terms? Um, it, it means that once a once a drug has been launched, right, it generates so much cash. That's why people talk about pharma companies being so cash rich. It also means that they have lots of money underneath that gross margin to spend. They spend it on R and D. They spend it on sales and marketing. They spend it on, you know, some president's club and some far away you know, <laughs> yeah. to, yeah. to reward, you know, yeah. the organization. So it's 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 a different kind of 
the P&L is different. And so you're you're going to invest differently in that business than you would in, in a diagnostics business. And you're going to spend a ton more on R&D in a pharma company than you would in a diagnostics company. Um, so that's that's one thing that I thought was kind of a learning experience is kind of think about like how to how that business model actually works. And then I think that another big difference is that, you know, the drug development process versus the the diagnostic development process, right? It's two completely different sort of processes and and thought, you know, how you think about it, right? And, you know, for a diagnostic and also life science tools, which is what I'm in now, it's it's much more about like you're trying to design something. You're trying to design a very specific solution. And, you know, you can you can create requirements around what that looks like. And then you kind of go through the engineering process to see if you can make something like that. You know, drug development is so is so different. Like you don't really uh, until maybe recently, right? You you didn't really try to engineer drugs. You didn't try to design them. You just like, okay, you just try to hope that you could find, you know, some active ingredient that would work against, you know, some sort of indication. And the way that, you know, it's really about the drug trials and, you know, trying to screen enough and get it through. So it wasn't so much that you you sit up front to say, I'm going to make, you know, this particular product, right? You're just hoping that you could find something as you go through this filtering process in, uh, in drug development. So it's a very, very different kind of thought process. And, strategic planning, I think, in terms of, you know, what what is it that carries that that business forward? And what do you need to do to invest in that business to make it successful? Totally. And the and I, you know, thank you for sharing that because like I think that level of nuance is like so critically important to the kind of understand um if you choose to embark on the diagnostics route, tools route, or going pharma R and D. Obviously like you know, you know, or uh, drug R and D is like changed really quickly so it's like it's a brave new world right now in terms of like you know the how how it's being approached um and uh and, and i just have a funny story about uh just drug development um and you know obviously protein folding very important and it's all you know obviously you know there's been a lot of media coverage on like you know aiml being able to help uh, simulate that my family friend's father um is a bear biologist at berkeley but also a master origami maker. And Big Pharma used to, way back when, consult him on protein folding pre-AIML because, because of the protein folding similarities to origami. Really? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, it just reminded me of that story. Because, and I, I brought the bear biologist thing because that's just like what he does day to day. He does origami on the side. But that was drug development. He's like, all right, we're, we're, we're thinking about a protein therapeutic. Can you help us think, like, conceptualize the, how the peptides are going to fold? And it was, yeah, it, they would use his origami expertise. Wow, that's, <laughs> um, crazy. that's crazy. That That's something you would not have expected to be, you know, something to leverage as part of your career. No. <laughs> that's that, but that's that, you know, that's a, that's a great, great story in terms of how those things kind of intersected. Yeah. And, and, it, you know, it's kind of obviously now we have like computers that kind of kind of like run the simulations. <laughs> but um, yeah, he, he we, every time we'd have like family dinner um, or meals, he would tell us these stories. And we're like, what? This is crazy. Um, yeah. So that's, but, that, that is crazy. <laughs> and, that is and, also, and also just like a quick question, too. Like you went from BMS to SciTech, which I'm going to assume was like drastically different in size and company experience. And, and SciTech, you know, I'm going to assume was like a smaller company. How was that experience for you going from big pharma to uh, you know, a smaller, a smaller organization? It's a definitely more intimate. You definitely get to know more of what's going on, different parts of the business. I think the other, other, you know, thing in, in pharma, or at least big pharma, right? They're, they're huge companies. And again, because they have a lot of, uh, cash or they have a, a lot of profit that they can use to invest there's a lot of it's very specialized roles like they they're like very specialized into very you know you have someone who can you know set paper just the right size right as opposed to you know somebody who's just doing general office work so it's it's very kind of specialized versus you go to 
and probably any smaller company, but particularly I'd say diagnostics, there wasn't so much of that 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 level of um, you know specificity. Um, uh, and you know it's so you get opportunities maybe to kind of uh, overlap in you know other areas. It's not so clearly defined that okay, this is this is my scope, and I'm only going to be in this little little world. Um, so I think that was that was good. I mean, that was great to kind of be able to kind of stretch out a little bit uh, where it's a little bit less defined, right? Exactly what, yep. what we're doing. And it's, it, it wasn't not such such a mature company. So obviously there are huge diagnostics companies as well. So I worked for one of them, which was Roche. But um, that uh, SciTech at the time, which later merged with Hologic. So today that company is Hologic. Um, and it was still very young, young at that stage. And and after that merger, um, did you stick around at Hologic as well? I did because as I was I was doing the international strategy. Part of what I was working on was a strategy for China, and um, the plan at the time, as I was kind of doing that, was, "Hey, great strategy about China. Why don't you go move over there and run it?" So that was uh, that was supposed to be my next role, and then the merger with Hologic happened. Hologic at the time didn't really build out a lot of international infrastructure. Um, they were more kind of what we call dealer based. So they'd have a few people based in different regions and they just manage a network of dealers rather than having their own sort of um, direct infrastructure around that time. So it was a little bit unclear for a little while exactly what would happen to that position. Um, but I ended up, you know, going over and running the China diagnostics business. Uh, for Cytex slash Logic uh, at the time, but it did deviate a little bit from you know here was the plan I proposed right, and that was going to be the the plan to execute on. But suddenly, okay, let's let's strip that down a little bit because that's not something we're real comfortable with here, and it sort of changed a little bit in its in its um, I guess strategy. So, but still, it was an incredible experience you know as an expat uh, living out there uh, for two years. Um, in China. Very cool. I, I, that was my next question is like, you know, like how, well, I guess it's a more personal question. How yeah. was like adjusting to life in China? So like, I mean, you know, at business and work, I mean, business yeah. and personal. I mean, it, I mean, it's tough. My Chinese is not great. Um, but you know, kind of just a, a marginal ability to, to get around, uh, with these. Um, but it was also very, I, again, it was a very exciting experience. Um, it was a new experience. So the company offered to have have a driver, right? You know, for me, but I, I, you know, it, it wasn't very practical because, like, you know, when you actually use the driver, it's like they have certain hours, but that's the hour I'm in the office, right? And so it's really the off hours that I I need a driver, not the the hours that I'm I'm in the office. So I end up just not having a driver and just driving myself. So driving yeah. was a great experience. That was cool. a very very interesting thing to learn learn about. Um, so I think it's true, like every city, like even in the United States has a different driving culture. But uh, I quickly learned actually like it it looks like driving in China is chaos and just a mass of cars everywhere. But there's a, a very clear logic to kind of how they go about it. And the logic is like you just have to be the first one to that spot. Like, yeah, there's no there's no such thing as right away. You just get there. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then like everyone just like backs off. So, yeah. You know, as long as you know that that's the rule, you, you get along fine. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like that implicit understanding. Um, yeah, would, yeah. It's, it's social, yeah, social rules there. Um, so it was, it was good. I mean, there's, there's uh, obviously a lot, a lot getting used to. And actually, that was my wife was was pregnant um, with our first child uh, when we were over there. So we had a, we had a little bit of a tricky decision to make whether or not to have the baby in China or to actually have her come back to have the baby in the United States. Um, and the interesting also thing was that I, at the time, I mean, this is, this is, uh, as I was saying, you know, SciTech is uh, liquid based cytology. So it's PAP testing. So, you know, I, you know, knew all of the top hospitals in China because those are the ones that are going to use this type of product uh, in their hospital, all the OBGYN department chairs and, you know, all of those, those folks in China. So I was very familiar with the, uh, the OB system in, in China. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, that did take, a, a a big part of my decision-making to decide to 
bring my wife back to the United States, have the baby in the United States and not, not have it in China. So it was still not quite up to the level. I think that, you know, you would, you would like to see compared to the standards of the United States. Got it. Got it. And was when you moved back to the United States, was that when you went over to Roche? I, I didn't know you mentioned you had worked at Roche. Yeah, actually. So we, we did two years in China. So I had the baby at some point in the middle and then baby came back and then we went back to, back to whole logic. So I, I stayed up, stayed there at whole logic for a little while longer. Um, and again, this is, this is pap, you know, the pap test is really for cervical cancer screening. So the larger field that I'm in now is cervical cancer screening and, uh, Cytec had also acquired a HPV testing company as well. So we also had an HPV test along with PAP testing uh, for cervical cancer screening. And Roche was just launching uh, their own HPV test. Um, so that's the role I ended up taking was running their HPV business um, from California, part of Roche, Roche Molecular. And and part of my also kind of just the the circle part of this journey is that I actually wanted to get back into something that was more molecular based, mo molecular biology based, um, which was not necessarily what I was doing, you know, at the time at, at, at Logic. And it, it's, it's funny because later after I left, Logic bought GenPro, which is a big, huge, you know, molecular diagnostics company. But at the time, I never thought that Logic would have the, really the portfolio to focus in on that, in that sort of molecular diagnostics field. So that's, Kind of why one of the reasons I went to Roche at the time. Got it. And did you move to California for uh, the role? Yeah. So we left uh, Boston area at that point to come to to the Bay Area to work uh, to work at Roche. Awesome. And and how was the how was the Roche experience? Um, you know, comparatively speaking, <laughs> it's great. It's a massive company, um, but the. In California, there was the di molecular diagnostics business unit. So there, they have these separate business units, even underneath diagnostics, that are fairly independent. Um, and you know, that was again another great learning experience, kind of the Roche way of doing things, and uh, a lot of structure, a lot of process there. Uh, I've, heard, I've heard, <laughs> I've heard, I've heard, I've <laughs> heard. Um, but it is it is a it is a great sort of to be part of like alumni from Roche. I mean, it's like half the people in the diagnostic field have worked at Roche at, at one point or another in their career because it's so, so big. Um, and so having kind of gone through that, I think it was a, it was a really, really good experience and just met also a lot of great, great people there as well. Awesome. And, you know, I, I've, I've heard the same thing on like during the well, family friends was with the round during the, the kind of Genentech Roche transition. Yeah. Kind of, it is kind of a, a similar experience in that way. Um, and so you're in California, um, for the diagnostic division, you're meeting some like stellar alumni and just kind of like a, a very historied, um, diagnostics company. Um, d you know, and I know your next, you know, your, or I believe your next opportunity that you look, you went into was Perkin Elmer. How did that transition and opportunity come about? The opportunity at Perkin Elmer wasn't so much, I would say Perkin Elmer as it was, there was a very specific product that they had launched that I was very interested in. And this is now the first part of, I would say my journey into what we're calling spatial biology. So it was one of the, the first commercial platforms that was very successful in kind of creating this value proposition that Hey, there's something going on inside the tissue that you can identify different molecular markers, in this case, protein markers, and really start to understand what's happening in that biology based on this relationship of different cells. And this was, to me, I, I thought started to really, really become a very fascinating and what I was thinking would be a very hot kind of explosive area. Uh, to move into uh, for the future, and this is this is now moving from you know the diagnostics world into life science tools. So, meaning that this is not clinical; this is more research focused, um, at least at this point in time. Um, and they were also kind of on the fringe of that, which was they wanted to bring that actually into the clinical space, and that was part of the the thought process of 
hey, this is still a research tool, but can this become clinical? And that was, again, you know, what was interesting for me, having a diagnostics background, was to be able to kind of come into that and kind of see if I could kind of help that transition into, into the diagnostics world. Very cool. What were some like challenges and triumphs that you experienced jumping into this new field? Yeah. So again, a lot of, a lot of learning. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah. starting over again. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. Here we go again. Um, yeah. So, so certainly a lot, a lot of learning, but there's a lot of crossover as well. And I think that's another thing that, that, you know, I always try to find sort of what's connecting it to something from the past or something I've already done and, and how do they relate? So, you know, for, for my prior role, which was in the HPV testing, um, or even before that, which was which was really the the liquid based cytology. So, this was cytopathology. You know, as a field of kind of looking at under the microscope these these in individual cells and trying to make diagnosis based on on looking at those cells. Um, this is now moving into the histopathology field, right? So it's same kind of pathology. It's just more now on tissue based rather than cell based. So there's a lot of same kind of experiences. You know, these are pathologist customers and, you know, kind of doing the same types of things. So there's a lot to, to kind of cross over in terms of just getting up to speed in this field very quickly. Um, but just some of the specifics around the technical side were quite, quite different, obviously, in what, what we were doing. So, you know, that's one of the things I always find is like, you know, you're, you end up, when you get it to a new role, right, you sort of have this grace period, right, where it's like, okay, I'm new, I'm the new guy, yeah. you yeah. like two weeks, right, to be yeah. the to be the new guy. Yeah. And, you know, usually there's some some onboarding plan, right, where you're gonna like, you're gonna spend the first few weeks kind of learning and training and trying to get up to speed. But a lot of times, you know, depending on your role, sometimes you get pulled into other meetings, you never really get the formal like training, like you're supposed to get the training done. Yeah. to learn like the, the technical parts of the product. And I've, I've found like over and over having made so many transitions, like that's like the most critical phase. Like you yeah. never want to lose that piece when you're, you're first starting into a new role and you have that opportunity really to get the deep dive technical training because, you know, after two months, right. You don't, you don't feel like, you don't feel like you want to ask that question. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. How does this work? Like, yeah. Like, well, come on. So your your best opportunity to kind of learn and really understand and get up to speed is really in that first, you know, that first phase. So you have to take advantage of that as as much as possible and not let yourself get pulled into, you know, oh, there's this meeting happening or you should sit in on that. And it's you you kind of want to separate yourself as much as you can in that beginning in order to be able to get that experience because you won't get that back later like it takes so much longer to get that learning over such a long period of time versus what you can do in the beginning in a short period of time totally and and that's a great point too because you're exactly right like once you kind of get out of that phase they're like okay here are deliverables i need yeah, you to yeah. start there's no to time. start doing yeah, there's no time to do your your like. Oh, I'm gonna sit back and learn. <laughs> right? Yeah, it almost feels like kind of uh, you know, your undergraduate kind of like you're in school, take the classes, do some learning. You know, yeah, you have to take some exams, but it's kind of like this like free. You you can go and ask these questions and just like be a sponge. Yeah, and and same way in a company too is exactly you have the ability to be like, hey, I'm new here. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna and you're. Like, in, in your head, you're probably, you can be like, well, I can ask the the quote unquote dumb questions and no one's going to snap at me for it. Right. But you only get a limited grace period, right? And yeah. Yeah. Something like the, the, the honeymoon's over, right? Like, yeah, you, you gotta, you gotta be able to, to deliver, as you said. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, And so you, you've gone through the grace period, you've absorbed everything kind of in your, in your kind of first foray into the, yeah. the, the this nascent industry. Yeah. Um, Can you, can you talk about once you got out of that kind of the grace period, what kind of, what were the kind of the things that you were, you know, doing at Perkin Elmer? Um, and I, I know eventually, uh, you know, Akoya also kind of joined forces with Perkin Elmer, your team specifically, how did that all kind of like transpire? Yeah. So one of, one of the things, and, and maybe getting back to kind of what we were talking earlier about that transition from pharma to diagnostics, I mean, this was also uh, maybe not as a dramatic of a change, but still a big change to go from uh, diagnostics into life sciences, which is, you know, basically unregulated. It's unregulated. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that, you know, 
the regulatory agencies and and the reimbursement, I mean, they effectively define right the the diagnostics and pharma industry. Like everything kind of goes through that process. And life science tools, you don't have that. And so there's there's so many more degrees of freedom in terms of theoretically what what you could be doing. Yep. Um, because you don't have that control process necessarily uh, limiting limiting you. And that's actually one of the big benefits, I think, of being in this field is that there is there's ability to move very quickly. You don't have to wait for the FDA to tell you, hey, you can't you can't get that launched or you got to do this study before you can, you know, release the product. And you don't have to wait for CMS or reimbursement to come in and say, hey, we're gonna reimburse at this this amount. So now you know how to price your your product. Um so you can move very, very quickly. And that's, again, a change in how you think about, like, how do you develop product and, and you know, how do you invest best behind it? Okay, so that, that's one piece. But in our case, at, at Perkin Elmer, what we actually were trying to do was actually trying to see, could we move it more into the diagnostics field? Yeah. Right. So we were actually asking to get into the yeah. regulated yeah. world. It's an enormous, enormous uh, hurdle. To get through right and just trying to understand particularly when you have new technology that has never been approved by the fda before and now you have to kind of explain to the fda well what is this thing you know how does it work and then what would be the right regulatory plan you know for studies and things to get approved right safety and effectiveness and all of that so it's it's very you know that's not there's not even a defined path there so it, it can be very challenging to kind of figure out like how, how to do it even. So we spent a lot of time just trying to figure out like, how do you get this through the FDA? Like, how do you make it a clinical diagnostic that, that can go through? And then, and then of course, none of it really matters unless you have sufficient reimbursement on the back end. So what does that look like? And what codes could we use? Or we have to create new codes. Then what studies do we have to show? And what payers do we have to get in front of? So it was a lot of that actually, which was really more on the regulatory reimbursement side and trying to solve for that in order to say, hey, it's, you know, as we continue to develop the product, um, this is the the pathway that we see in terms of opportunity. That, and that's like a whole world. I think the whole regulatory, everything you that just described yeah. is like, it's a very big aspect of diagnostics and, and, you know, dr like getting a drug approved. Yeah. And it's also just feels like, you know, whenever I think about going from just like what, like working at the bench to that, to getting that point, it feels so daunting. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it feels like this insurmountable amount of like, I like, I, I know biochemistry, but I know nothing about regulatory reimbursements and like all of this. Um, so that's like, you, you're learning spatial biology and you're now a regulatory wizard <laughs> or like, you know, you've embarked on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's certainly very challenging. And I think what's tough about it is even more so on the reimbursement side, because these are things that you really don't have a whole lot of control over. Like you're, you're going to do, you know, your economic modeling, you know, cost effectiveness, you're going to do your clinical studies and try to show the clinical benefits. But then it really comes down to, you know, there's decision-making bodies that decide like how much reimbursement is going to go in the private payers, you know, have to make, make these also decisions. So you're, you're really, you don't control necessarily timing. You don't control decisions. So you don't really know like whether or not this can be successful or not. So there's a lot of risk around it, and it's you know potentially a lot of cost, right? Because you're going to have to invest behind uh, getting it getting it forward. So I think that that really has been one of the more daunting things, particularly with these new technologies. Like you're saying, okay, look, yeah, everyone can see like there's a benefit here. There's 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 added value. There's there's medical value here, but to get through all of those processes are are just very very tough. Absolutely. And Perkin Elmer is a, a sizable company. So there's, you probably had a, you know, a team, <laughs> like it wasn't just like, you know, one person, like this is your job. It's kind of like you have like a experts who may have done, done it before, um, who might be able to. Well, work. well, that, that actually was not so much the case. I mean, we did have regulatory people there. Certainly there was a clinical side to Perkin Elmer. 
um, but it's sort of a different different field. And um, I think the I think this ultimately was, you know, without getting into sort of too much of the 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 detail here, um, or you know, what what went behind closed doors, you know, part of part of the spin out for my business there, which was the Phenoptics platform and merging it into Akoya. Um, I mean, we were looking to spin out. And part of the reasoning from the Perkin-Elmer management at the time was, look, you know, we don't have the kind of infrastructure that's going to be able to resource this support. We're like, we'd have to build this. And, you got it. you know, guess what? We don't have a budget to build it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, probably is not going to be as effective as you would like it to be in perkin -Elmer. So maybe, you know, we can find a different home for this to, to be able to continue to, to drive that forward. And that really was uh, on the perkin -Elmer side and, and my business side, kind of how we sort of moved out. And, and, you know, the reason why I think both sides felt like it was a good idea to kind of separate out and, you know, it makes sense. It's not, it was not a core area for Perkin Elmer. So they would have to just, you know, build and invest in it. And, you know, it would be very difficult, I think, within their sort of financial structure to be able to do something like that at that time. So, yeah. So then that's how then I ended up at Akoya because we were looking either to go, go as a standalone, right, as a standalone company. Um, but it just so happened that there was uh, this other company called Akoya Biosciences, which was pre-commercial at the time. And they were planning to launch uh, a product that also looked at proteins in tissue, except this time even more proteins. Yeah, yeah. So this is where we thought, hey, that, that, that would work well. Like we could, you know, put together both platforms under one umbrella. And then we branded it the Spatial Biology Company, which we did. And... Um, you know, that became sort of the, the new Akoya, Akoya Biosciences at the time. Awesome. And, you know, it is interesting, too, because like Frick and Elmer is a kind of large company and Akoya is a, you know, a, is a smaller outfit than Frick and Elmer. How was that process, like this kind of like acquisition, merger, M&A event? What was your experience with that? Um, going from like yeah. being a part of a larger org and then joining forces with a, yeah. you know, a smaller no. org? So the first part was there's a transactional piece to it, which is how do you, you know, how do you negotiate the deal between Perkin Elmer and Akoya? And when I say Akoya, it's really the the private equity firm that that owns Akoya or majority of Akoya, right? So they're negotiating on like, okay, what's the price? What's the deal terms? All of this stuff to be able to divest it out and then integrate it into Akoya. And for me, it was a, it just it was such a such a interesting experience because I was literally on both sides of this, right? And in some respects, I'm Perkin Elmer, you know, trying to to help manage that part of the deal process and make it go through. On the other hand, I knew I was going to be brought over into the new Akoya. So, you know, those are sort of my new new best friends on that side. Yeah. So yeah. I had to, I had to play both sides. And so, you know, some of the deal discussion I was left out because, you know, I'm kind of conflicted. But in other situations was just as challenging, kind of trying to figure out how do you balance your role in that transaction to to divest out, you know, as the Perkin Elmer side or, you know, I'm kind of representing now sort of the Akoya side as the buyer uh, of the business. Um, so that was probably the, the first piece of it. But it definitely was, you know, going into now what was a really small company at the time. So we brought over, I don't remember how many people we brought over from, from Perkin Elmer uh, from my business, but it's probably like 35 people or so and maybe 15 people already at Akoya. So, you know, the company at the time, maybe when I started was, was like 50 people, you know, combined. And it's a really... Now, now we're at a scale that's you know completely different than what I'm used to. It is it is a really kind of startup scale company at this point. Although what we brought over was a, a more established product line, which was already generating revenue, was already kind of part of a business. So you know at the same time we had to manage that as a business without really having a lot of you know scale for the for the company. That's all for this episode of the Biotech Startups Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our discussion with Terry Lowe. Tune in to part three of our conversation to learn more about his journey. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to having you join us again on the Biotech Startups podcast for part three of Terry's story. The Biotech Startups podcast is produced by Exceda. Don't want to miss an episode? Search for the Biotech Startups podcast wherever you get your podcasts and click subscribe. Exceda provides research labs with equipment leases on founder-friendly terms to support paths to exceptional outcomes. To learn more, visit our website, www.exedr.com. On behalf of the team here at Exceda, thanks for listening. The Biotech Startups podcast provides general insights into the life science sector through the experiences of its guests. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from the podcast is at the user's own risk. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not the views of Exceda or sponsors. No reference to any product, service or company in the podcast is an endorsement by Exceda or its guests.